You are watching TFI. Greetings, salutations, welcome to TFI for a refresh of a four-year-old video, one that I had no idea at the time was going to turn out to be the most popular, one of the most popular ones that I've ever done. Learn Inventor in under an hour, I've re-tagged this and called it a test drive. It's probably more accurate to what this is. Uh, but thousands of people have gotten their Inventor careers off to a solid start off the back of that first video. And if you stick with this, it is a bit of a long one. It's going to need a bit of patience, but that could be you too if you stick it through. And if you've bounced here off the back of that old one, then you've done a good job, mate, because there's nothing in that old one that isn't going to be in this one. It's pretty much the same content. It's the same structure and workflow. It's just been modernized for the newer versions of Inventor. So before we get into a big video like this, there's a few important points that I've got to cover before we get going. First, indeed I'm using Inventor 2020. You can follow me along with an older version if that's all you've got, but just bear in mind, mate, there's been a roughly 25 major releases of Inventor over the years, and it changed all the way through those years. I can't guarantee that when I'm doing something in today's version, that it's gonna be in your version. It might look a bit different, and that could be confusing. So if you need the latest version of Inventor, because you, you've, let's just be honest, you might have a dodgy old copy that you fished out of the torrents, it's less than legal. I ain't judging, that's fine. But if you want the latest version, I strongly advise that you do learn on the latest version as possible, because let's be honest, you're doing it probably because you're looking to further your career with those kind of skills. And now's not the time to get into it. I'm one of those employers myself who looks for people with inventor skills. And I strongly recommend having experience on the latest versions because that's what employers use and that's what they look for. And it's only going to work in your favor if you look like you've invested the time and, and the effort to get current with the latest version of inventor that the employers are using. So with that in mind, there is a link in the description. It's an, it's an Autodesk affiliate link for me, but if you go to that link, it'll take you to the Inventor store. At the top of the page, there's a free trial button. If you register up, that'll give you a fully working 30-day copy of Inventor. That's the same as retail. It's not missing out on any features, but it'll work for 30 days whilst you get your head around. And if you do end up deciding to buy Inventor and subscribe to it on the Autodesk website, because it was an affiliate link, I'll get a bit of a kickback, which it's entirely optional but that's what that link is down there. Also in the description is a link to my Dropbox account. That is the files that's needed for this tutorial. So if you'd be so kind, click that link, go to the Dropbox page, download the file. It's a self-extracting executable, double click it, extract the files to the default location, which is the C drive, and then we'll come back to those once we get going. Reet, finally, what you wanna do now is fire up Inventor, get it loaded up, and we need to go through some settings to make sure that your Inventor looks the same as mine, because if we get to certain bits within the, uh, the test drive and yours looks a bit different than mine, then that could leave you stumped entirely. So this bit is really important. Right, here we are, Autodesk Inventor's fired up. So the first thing we're gonna do, and this is, I guess, the start of the tuition here, is you wanna click the project projects button up at the top. Now projects is quite unique to Inventor and it's a way for you to tell Inventor where the files that you're working on are stored. It's like a little subfolder set where all the files and drawings and parts and assemblies and everything you're going to create for this project are all stored in one area. So we're just going to work with the default one for now. We're just going to leave that on. We'll load in a different project later on, but double click the default project and make sure that is ticked and then click Done. Right, next go into application options. This is the inventor main settings. You want to click the file button at the top and then go into options and then you'll see a bunch of tabs. So we're not going to go over what all the settings are, but you just want to make sure that your settings are the same as mine. So on the general tab, just have a look down, scan through it, make sure you can pause the video if you need to, but just make sure all your settings are the same as mine. And the only one I'm going to change is to change the annotation scale to 1.5. So any dimensions that appear on screen, they're just scaled up slightly larger because they are quite small by default. And then click apply to confirm that setting. Right, next go to the sketch tab and then just make sure again, all of your settings here are the same as mine. If you're missing any boxes or if there's anything that looks differently, don't worry too much about it. Just make sure everything that you've got that matches mine is the same, right? Go into the file tab. Uh, and this bit is super important. What you wanna do is go into configure default template. So all the people that skipped ahead and didn't read and watch this bit, they're gonna struggle here because they should have done this. You wanna click millimeters and then ISO and then click okay, but stop, wait. I, I have to assume if you're learning Inventor, you're not in a corporate office right now with other people who are using Inventor. What I'm saying is, 
if you've got anything in this path here other than what you see here, like in public documents and blah, 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 that's a local path. If you've got a network path in there, do not click OK and do not change these settings because it'll change it'll change the templates for other people as well. You, you don't want to do that. If it's just you on your own, you're fine. Just click millimeters and ISO and then click OK. Uh, and that should be it for the file tab. Right, and then for the rest of them, just match mine. There's the part tab. Uh, colors. I'm using the light theme, that's unique to 2020. If you're using an older version, you won't see that. You're probably using winter night, which is fine. The colors will be slightly different on screen, but it's nothing too much to worry about. I'm gonna disable enhanced highlighting because it's an awful setting. Uh, we'll turn that off. Go to the display tab. Again, just make sure all these settings are the same as mine. Same with assembly. And then on hardware, uh, you, you can change it to quality if you want. It defaults to performance. It just applies, quality applies a very minor amount of, of smoothing, or otherwise known as anti-aliasing onto the edges of on-screen objects when quality mode is enabled, but it's nothing that really is going to change much uh, from what I'm seeing. Going to the drawing tab, again, just make sure this is all the same. My settings are mostly default, so there shouldn't be too much different. And then, and then the content center tab, right? What you want to do, this is super important. Again, those skippers are going to struggle with this one right you want to make sure invented desktop content is checked and then you want to take this path here just highlight it all with the left mouse button right click and then copy open up file explorer on your computer winners explorer whatever and then paste that into the top address bar and then if your folder here is empty and there's nothing in there like you're not seeing all of these idcl files if you don't see file extension you can go to view and then turn on file name extensions uh, if you don't see this, you're going to have to go back to the, the media, the download that you installed Inventor from, load that back up, and then you'll see during the, the install options that there was an option to install Inventor desktop content. You want to go through that again and then make sure that's installed because these are all the libraries containing nuts and bolts and washers and stuff, and we're going to be using those a little bit later on. So if that's empty, pause the video, go and do that. Make sure that this folder is populated with these files. Again, it's Inventor desktop content. Once that's done, come back to the settings, still make sure this is checked, and then click close on the application options, and we are good to crack on. And the last point, uh, before we get going, get a lot of questions about what PC I'm using, mouse and all that sort of stuff came out of the last video. You can pretty much use any PC or laptop to follow along here. What we're doing isn't intensive on the hardware. And throughout this, I'm going to be using the 3D Connection CAD mouse. I'll put a picture up on screen. It's a very, very nice mouse for CAD work. And there's an Amazon link in the description if you want to just take a look at it, if you're interested in seeing what that is and how much it costs. But any mouse will do the job whilst you're getting started. I'd also highly recommend in the long run, not right now, now, a 3D mouse, again, picture on screen. If you stick through CAD and become a regular uh, 3D CAD user, one of these is highly recommended. Uh, link to one of those is also in the description. I'm not going to be using one of those for this video because I imagine most people watching this likely won't have one. Right, mate, now that we're done with all the settings, we are kind of nearly ready to get going. What you want to do, if you didn't do this when I first mentioned it, is head on over to your downloads folder, uh, get the file that's linked in the description, the Dropbox link, Double click that, that's a self-extracting executable. Leave the C drive as the default, click unzip, and it'll say 101 files unzipped successfully. Close that, and then we are good with the files for now. Right, in Inventor, you wanna go over to the Projects button. Uh, everything that I'm gonna be covering in Inventor, I'll try and explain as briefly as I can in passing, but you have to understand that the amount of stuff we're going through, I can't give a full training course on everything that we're touching as we go through this, uh, but I have done individual videos on most of the things that we will be passing. But it's a bit of uh, prep work that we need to do to get this, uh, to get these files working. So you wanna click the browse button at the bottom and then browse to your C drive. So go to this PC, go to C, and then go to this Inventor R10 test drive folder, which is just what we've unzipped, and then double click gocart.ip J. Project Files Inventor's way of saying all the files we're working on are underneath this subfolder here, and then you tick the one that you're actually working on. Uh, on the right hand side, you want to click this Configure Content Center Libraries button, uh, and then you want to make sure we've covered this in a previous step, so you should have all of these libraries in here. And um, if you don't, you'll have to rewind back and go to the bit where I talked about the Content Center settings. But you want to make sure that you tick all of these. You don't have to tick custom content, but just all of the ones that are Inventor ISO, Inventor GIS, all that kind of stuff. Just make sure they're all ticked. And that just tells Inventor that when we're using this project and we're going to place nuts and bolts, make sure that you include them from these libraries. 
Okay, on that, save that project. Uh, it'll say, do you want to migrate it? Click yes, because it's an old project file. And then done, mate. Okay, we're good to go. So click new. Uh, and then Inventor is going to throw you up a, a, a list of templates. These are all starting points for Inventor. Like, think of it like Lego. Uh, each Lego block is an IPT. Individual parts are IPTs, Inventor parts. And then when you put all the Lego blocks together, you get an assembly. And then that's how you build things in Inventor. You design the blocks and then you put them all together to create an assembly, which is the standard .iam. So double-click IPT. And then that'll take us off into the new file environment. So I'll take you through the interface of what we're looking at here. So um, you, if it's the first time you've ever seen Inventor, you know exactly what it is we're actually looking at. Along the top of Inventor, this is the quick access toolbar right up here at the top. You've got standard Windows functions like new file, save, open, redo, undo, that kind of stuff. Just below that is the ribbon bar, and that's broken out in panels, tabs, and actual buttons. So you've got these tabs along the top, uh, and these all do different things, and it's mostly context-sensitive Inventor, so it'll change the ribbon bar based on what environment you're in. And then each one of these panels has like a cluster of related buttons. So like this first panel here, this is all creation tools, and then the second one here is like all modify tools, uh, and then surface tools, etc., etc., etc. On the left-hand side down here, this is known as the browser. This is a tree structure showing you, again, context sensitive, but if you're in a part file, the, the browser will show you a tree structure of all your, your sketches, your features, everything that makes up the model. If you're in an assembly, it's all the parts that make up that assembly, and in a drawing, it's all the views and whatnot. And then the right-hand side, this big area here, this is the graphical window, the viewport, the main graphics area, I guess you could call it, and it doesn't really have a name, nobody actually calls it by its name, uh, but it's the viewport. Uh, on the right-hand side of the viewport, you've got this view cube here, and you can click faces on this, and it'll sort of spin the camera around when you're looking at something. This is the view navigation toolbar. I don't think it's frequently used by a lot of people, but it's got, like, zoom window, uh, orbit, look at, a couple of other zoom tools on there, which are kind of consistent across a lot of Autodesks. Products, read, click open, which is the button at the top, and then double click start go kart.iam. And this is going to open up a very primitive looking go kart. It's a very, very old data set that I'm using here, but it's it's really good for taking you through the basics of Inventor and demonstrating what it can do and how powerful it is. But yeah, this assembly is starting to look pretty dated. So when you get the prompt, yeah, just click yes on that, and then Inventor will go away, update all the files, and do its thing in the background. And then there we go. That's the Assembly opened. So to test the view tools, uh, there's a number of different ways you can orbit, zoom, and pan and invent. You end up settling on the one that you just find the most comfortable or the one that you were told how to use first. Uh, but for example, zooming in and out, if you use the middle wheel on the mouse, if you push it away from you, it'll zoom out. If you pull it towards you, it'll zoom in. It does it in like staged, staggered steps. Uh, press the middle wheel down, and you'll see you get like a little hand cursor. Keep the middle wheel held down and move the mouse, it'll pan around. Double click the middle wheel does a zoom extents. Uh, if you press F4 on the keyboard, you'll get this little circular crosshair thing appear. If you hold down the left mouse button, whilst you've got F4 held down inside that circle, it'll do an orbit. Uh, let go of both F4 and the left mouse, and it'll stop the orbit. Uh, whilst you've got F4 pressed down, you can put the cursor on the little quadrant lines, these little lines on the axes of the circle here, and it'll do like a restrained orbit around that axis. Uh, if you press a shift in the middle wheel, it'll do an orbit. That's another way. It's pretty much the same as F4. It's slightly different, but to be honest, uh, it does the same job. Uh, and then that's pretty much it, mate. So with those, you can get around wherever you need to. Zoom in, zoom out, pan, zoom extents, F4, orbit. Uh, one tip that I will be using throughout this is quite often... When you're doing an orbit, you'll you'll zoom in on something and you'll orbit and it'll shoot off the screen like this. You see, like if I want to just look at the back side of this uh, this part here, it's just flying off the screen. Once you've pressed F4, if you press the left mouse button, just give it a single click inside the circle, it'll reset the pivot point so that the camera orbits around wherever you click. So if I click around here, the camera centers and now it's orbiting around that point. And that's a really handy tool. It just saves you like orbit and then panning and then orbiting and then panning when something flies off of the screen. Uh, last tip, a problem last tip, is uh, there's the zoom in and zoom out with the middle wheel actually heads in the direction where your cursor is. So if you want to zoom in towards this pedal here, just move the cursor over the pedal and then zoom in and it'll fly towards wherever your cursor is. Uh, so now if I want to zoom in over here, 
See, it just goes wherever your cursor is. So it takes a bit of while, it takes a bit of time to get used to that, but once you know that it does that, it becomes sort of second nature. Right, what we're doing then, mate, right, this is gonna be a test drive, taking you through how to model a part, put the part into this assembly, and then fix it in place. And the part that we're gonna be designing, if you go to open the top toolbar, go to the finished parts folder, and then double click finished carrier, this is the part that we're gonna be modeling up. So it's gonna be roughly the same as this, uh, we're going to start from scratch, get that modelled up, and then put it into the, the assembly, and then fix it in place, and we're going to bolt it using these bolt holes up here. Right, close that down, just hit the little cross up here. This little cross is uh, closed down the document you've got open, whereas obviously that one there shuts down the entirety of Inventor. That's basic Windows stuff. All right, click New at the top, this button here, and then you want to select Standard.IPT. We already had one open at the bottom, didn't we? Never mind, we're going to have two open. <laughs> just actually, we'll both shut down part one. Hit the little cross on the tab at the bottom, it'll close that one down. Right, we are good to get going. So we're gonna start with sketching. Now I'd love, it's my, it's kind of in my nature to explain everything that I'm doing as I'm doing it, but I've done two previous takes of this and I ended up like with 40 minutes on sketching and in part creation and then I didn't leave much time for anything else. So I'm gonna blast through this really quickly. I'm not gonna explain everything that I'm doing. I'm just gonna do it. You can follow me along and then if you wanna know more about why certain things happen, there's learning content on my channel which should explain various bits and pieces uh, that have happened throughout this process. So to start, we're gonna click the 2D sketch button up here. Uh, alternatively, we can right click inside the empty space and we can use this marking menu as well, which is sort of quick access to the most regularly uh, access tools at this point in time. So when there's nothing going on in Inventor, for example, new sketch down here is something you would frequently do, so it's readily available uh, at the flick of your wrist. And I really mean that because you can press the right mouse button and then just flick your wrist down and it will access a new sketch. You can also draw this little line. This is so you're sort of pointing it towards where the new sketch is. So you'd have to memorize new sketches that way, right click, drag, and it'll draw this little line and activate new sketch. Anyway, right, we're gonna select the XY plane and then I'll create a new sketch, drop it on the XY plane. And the XY plane is this bit of paper that runs through the center of space. Uh, it's like a flat surface to start your sketching on uh, as the first sketch in this part file. And that then looks the camera straight down, gives us a couple of axes, gives us a center point as well. This is the center point of space. And it says, right, there's your start point. What do you want to design? Get cracking, mate. So we can select circle up here, and then we're gonna snap the center of the circle to this little yellow dot, pull it away. And you can type in dimensions here. You can say, oh, I'm gonna just make a circle that's 50 millimeters in diameter, 60 millimeters in diameter. Or if these are common dimensions that we need to reference later on, and I need to be able to identify them in a big, massive list of dimensions, I can actually name my dimensions and say this is gonna be inner diameter, and the inner diameter equals 40 millimeters, and then Inventor goes, ah, right, okay, well, let's create the circle at 40 millimeters right off the bat, and then it creates that dimension and gives it an internal name, and you can see the internal name is by just clicking this FX button up at the top. These are your parameters, which is a fancy word for dimension. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a dimension, but they call them parameters. Uh, but it's not a dimension in that you'd see it on a drawing. This doesn't need to be neat and tidy. It doesn't appear on a drawing sheet. It's just for the purposes of constructing your model. But inner diameter is used on sketch one, which is what we've just made. We've just made the first sketch, which is called sketch one. And inner diameter's units is millimeters, and it's 40 millimeters. And then as you're building your model, this list of parameters will build up and build up and build up. And you can actually come back to this at any point and just change the size of it from this one. It's, it's, it's not quite Excel-driven design, but it's Excel looking driven design nearly there. But you, you can do Excel driven design, but not from this area. Anyway, click done on that. Uh, whilst it's left at 40 millimeters, and we're gonna go back into circle and we're gonna create a second circle and snap to the middle, green dot, pull away. And this time we are just gonna approximately place the circle. I'm not sure how big it's gonna be, but let's say roughly about here. That'll do. Press escape, and you can see the circles are two different colors. And the reason for that is that Inventor knows when sketch geometry, when entities in your design have uh, undes undefined sizes and positions and shapes. So if something hasn't been given a dimension and it has the freedom to move, 
then it changes its color and in my case it's purple and when something has no ref no freedom to move whatsoever it's fixed in space it's black that means it's fully constrained which means if i grab it by the left mouse button and just pull it around you see the circle isn't going anywhere whereas if i do the outer one it will actually go bigger and smaller because it doesn't have a dimension on it so in order to put the dimension on it well, you can use the general dimension tool up here at the top, mate. Uh, and then this is where we can start plugging in some design intent. So I know that this this metal part that I'm going to create for the go-kart, I know the wall thickness here between these two circles is going to be 20 millimeters. So what I can do is I can create the dimension, drop it on here, and instead of just typing in 60, because it's going to be 20 millimeters larger than the inner diameter, I can actually say, right, well, this is going to be called the outer dia, and it equals inner dia plus 20 millimeters. And then it builds in this formula. It's almost like a, it is a bit of design intent. It's like, right, well, no matter what happens to this inner diameter, that can change to 60 itself, but that outer diameter will always be that one plus 20 millimeters. And that then remains for the rest of this model's life. Doesn't matter who comes into it and changes it, it will always be 20 millimeters larger than the inner diameter. So we can finish the sketch on that. Uh, we can orbit around just so we can see it from a more orthographic angle, give us a better perspective of what's going on. And then we're ready to create this into a bit of 3D material and we can use extrude for that. And the way extrude works is it takes a sketch profile. If you're an AutoCAD user, it's like a hatch boundary. So you can take this hatch boundary profiled closed loop area. Uh, there's an inner one as well. You could use that one. You can see how Inventor highlights it so it knows, or well, it's, it's telling you what it's gonna actually extrude up. Give that a click with the left mouse button and then you can drag this orange arrow up and say, well, I don't, do I know how big I want this to be? Do I know what the, to the how tall I want it to be? Uh, maybe about 40, maybe about 40 itself, about that high. That should be good for thickness. Well, then you can come into the distance here and you can say, okay, well, the height of this model is going to be 40 millimeters. And we can also ex go extrude up by 40 millimeters down by 40 millimeters or can go both ways 20 up and 20 down from the sketch plane click ok on that and that's our first bit of 3d material created it's very simple looking but it's on the way mate it's on the way to being something spectacular the next thing we're going to do is another sketch and then we're going to ex we're going to expand the origin folder in the browser here and this gives us a bunch of construction planes that we can create further sketches on. So I know I'm gonna create a, a sketch on the XY plane because the XY plane runs exactly through the middle. So I'll just escape out of that and then click the XY plane and then do an orbit. You can see that plane runs exactly through the middle because remember we extruded 20 up and 20 down. Uh, so we can use that to sketch through the middle. If that didn't exist, you can use construction planes to, uh, to create further faces to sketch on for example you can say give me a plane but i want to make it through the middle of that face and then that face and you can see it puts a construction plane directly through the middle of those two faces so there's a couple of different ways you can do that but we've got our xy plane that's good enough for us we can sketch on that then we can press f7 and that will do a temporary cross section otherwise known as slice graphics it gets rid of all the material above the sketch plane remember we're sketching to the middle here so there's a whole 20 millimeters worth of material sort of protruding towards my face so <laughs> press f7 and it just does a temporary slice to get rid of stuff that we don't need to see. Then I'm gonna start the line command and then I'm gonna just hover the cursor over the edge of the circle and then you can see it just pro it, it sort of projects this black edge around and that's gonna give us something to snap onto. Because remember, we are sketching through the center of a face here where there is no physical line to snap onto. So that little black edge you saw was it automatically projecting up this bottom edge here to snap onto. So we can go back around snap to around here come away drop it the line about there i know i kind of know in my mind what shape i want this to be but i'm not sure what size it is yet i can't draw it exact just now so i can just do it approximately and then put the dimensions on later on now the next thing i want to do is like an arc i want a tangential arc coming out of here so instead, yeah i could press escape i could go into the arc command but what i can also do is just hold the left mouse button down on the end point of this line and then sweep the mouse away in like an arc motion and then it'll it'll sort of sweep and project an arc out from the end of that line and then it'll tangentially constrain it to that line as well so it's not coming out at a funky weird angle and then we can end the arc around here make sure that tracking line is in place 
and that makes sure the end of the arc terminates exactly uh, vertically beneath the end point of the, of the line above. Let go of the left mouse button there, come away, and then snap back on to the edge. Right click and then OK. So one thing to do is to just zoom in to the end points of these lines, just grab them, pull them away, make sure that these did indeed snap onto that circular edge. And come in here, grab him, pull it away. Yep, you can see as long as you grab the end of the line with the left mouse button, as long as it's sort of sliding along that edge and it's not detaching and coming away, then we are good. If it is detaching and coming away, if you didn't quite get it snapped onto that edge, just use a coincident constraint, this one here, uh, and then click the end point and then that edge. But you can see mine already exists, so we're good. Okay, a couple of extra things we need to do. Now, there is a lot of freedom to move within this sketch here. If I grab this, you can see that there, that's not tangent, clearly. That needs to be tangent. Uh, the, the angle of these lines is all off. The center of this arc needs to be in line with the middle of the part. So that needs to be sort of roughly up there. So there's a lot of work that we need to do with this, but it doesn't take too long to do it. We can, uh, we can quite easily bang this out. So we're going to start by drawing a construction line. This is going to be used a little bit later on. So click line, construction line, snap to the middle of the model, pull along to the right, and then just drop that. Make sure it's, you can, just, you can tell when it snaps to the horizontal. Make sure you click the left mouse button after it's snapped to the horizontal and that you see this little glyph thing here appear. Escape on that. And then we're going to select const uh, coincident constraint and that will snap the center of this arc to the construction line. It, it fixes it. So it doesn't matter what happens, what dimensions happen, what movement happens, the center of that arc is always fixed to that construction line. And then we can do the same with a tangential constraint, this one here, give that a click, then the arc and the line you can see boom look at that man that was quite that was quite satisfying it just makes sure that there's a tangent uh, flow between that arc and that line and then we're going to select a symmetry constraint which is this one here and then select the top line the bottom line and then the construction line and then it creates like this mirrored effect press escape grab these lines you can see there you go they're like exactly mirrored between, uh, just over that construction line so that works quite nicely all right dimension on the arc I'm going to make this six mil and then whilst the dimension line is still activated i know that this to this is going to be give that a click roughly around 20 degrees so that's that's probably good enough for now i don't know and i can't remember what the distance or the, the hole spacing is on the go-kart so there's going to be a tapped hole here eventually uh which is going to line up with the tapped holes on the brake disc of the go-kart, but I can't remember what the distance was from uh, the centre of the axle to where these bolt holes are. So I'm just going to leave this free to move up and down for now, and we can come back to that a bit later on. So we can click Finish Sketch, jump back over to Extrude, select this profile, the leg that we've just made. You can, Whilst you're in the Extrude as well, you can orbit around so you can get a better... You can just take a look at what you've got going on here so you, you don't have to like extrude it and be blind with it now you can open it around whilst the extrudes active uh, and then we'll extrude by distance of let's say 12 millimeters in both directions six either way and i think i'm happy with that so that's going to add some material to this part and it's going to join it to that cylindrical face and that's looking Pretty good, that, isn't it? Something pretty good. So we need to do this six more times. Don't forget, this is going to be slotted onto the axle. And these are the holes here that, that them legs are going to get bolted up against. So we need to create six of those legs for each one of these, uh, these holes here. So we can jump back into the part. And we can go to the circular pattern, select the leg. And then for the rotation axis, we're going to spin this feature that we've just made around the center line of this face and we want six of them around 360 degrees click okay and e easy as that easy as that mate easy as that okay then what we can do what we can do next let's let's do a fillet now the fillet command is the way of getting rid of hard corners and hard sharp edges uh, and it's it can be used for a whole bunch of things, but it essentially rounds off an edge. So when you select the fillet command, you can just manually click an edge and you can see it's pretty simple and straightforward what it's going to do there. It's going to round off that edge that you've selected. You can further click further edges like this, 
can carry on going and as you click on them you can see it's selected seven edges in total that's you know there's one two three on the top of that leg and the radius is two millimeters but another thing you can do let's just give that a click and then delete so i didn't actually want to do those instead of manually clicking the edges you can actually tell it to just go through the entire model and fill it everything so let's do that we'll change the radius to one mil and tell it to go for all fillets and all rounds and which is essentially all concave and all convex edges and then we can actually do you know what for these ones here we'll change that to two millimeters so these ones up against here are a little bit larger and then click ok <laughs> look at that how effective is that and how little effort was it dead simple dead simple and anything that we're doing we can go back and change it if you thought actually okay two mils good but i, I, I want to see what it looks like with a three mil fillet well you can just come back into the browser which is like a historical record of everything you've done right click on the fillet edit the feature and then you can just come back straight into here and then change it we can do the same with any of the other features we've done even the leg we can right click on that and go to edit feature and we can change the distance that it was extruded by we can even expand the extrusion go to the original sketch that we made and then edit that sketch and we can change anything about this we can make the leg a little bit bigger click finish sketching see boom updates straight away as long as it can still compute as long as there's no material intersecting and overlapping with itself or something else you're usually good to make changes to anything you've done at any point in the past uh, with this model okay right that's the fillet done what we're going to do next is tap a hole through the legs so we're going to find out which one was the first leg that we made so it's this one here so we're going to tap a hole through here and then we need six of them how do we do that? Do we draw a circle and cut it through? No, no, obviously this is, this is mechanical design. It's a manufacturing toolkit. So we've got tools which are intended for the work that you're doing and then it'll inherently embed metadata into the model that can be used later on downstream. For example, the whole command. All you do, it's dead, dead simple. You just tell it, right, well, I'm, I wanna create a hole. This is the new hole palette that we've got here, and it's sort of top down. You look at the top, work your way down. What kind of hole is it? What thread do you want on it? What's the depth of the hole? And then at the end, boom, go and make the hole. Uh, you can configure this quite in depth if you want to, or you can just say, I want a hole on that face, send it to that edge, and I know that it's gonna be size six, and it's going to be an isometric profile it's a tapped hole we've got different types of holes we've got clearance holes tapered holes simple holes uh, you can even put counter bores and counter sinks on them and spot faces but we're just going to say give me an m6 bolt hole tap it all the way through it's right hand thread direction and that's it for me click okay <laughs> there it is just click click it's done if you want to do an orbit you can do you can just take a look through there you can see it taps it all the way through uh, that thread there is not a physical thread, it's just a thread representation, but there is metadata inside this model, which Inventor knows that that is actually a groove thread. Okie dokie. Right, so we need we need six more of them, don't we? So how do we do that? Do we do we create the whole tool six more times or five more times? Or and Of course, we don't know. We can just pattern it around. Uh, but what we can do, if you want to be a little bit clever, remember on, in the first sketch, we linked the inner dyer and the outer dyer together. Well, we can do that with the legs and the holes. So if we go back into the circular pattern, right click on that and edit that feature. So there's six legs and that's picked it just from the number six, but we can actually go number of legs. There can't be spaces in these parameter names. That's why it's a funky, weird name. Number of legs equals six. So that that's created the number six and gave it a name in the parameter list. So if we go into the FX area, you can see here we've got number of legs is six and UL stands for unitless because it's, it's not millimeters, it's not meters, it's just six of. And then we can click done on that. And then for the hole, we can go to circular pattern, select the hole, you can either click it in the browser, or you can click it in the, the main window if you can actually, if you can get the cursor over it because it's sort of jumping between the leg and the hole. Uh, Come on, come on, come on, come on. No, I was picking the process. This is a little bit difficult when it's off at an angle. 
And then we're going to go to the rotation axis, center line again, and then for the placement, instead of the number six, we can, oh crap, what did I name that parameter? I cannot remember how I spelled it, what format I typed it out in. Uh, what, what did I, right, well what you can do is just select this arrow, list all the parameters available to be used, and then there it is, number of legs, give that a click, and it links the two together. So now the number of holes is exactly the same as the number of legs. And by that, if you, if you double click circular pattern and then ch change the number of legs down to say four, there's always gonna be four holes. It's not gonna try and tap six holes through four legs, for example. They're always gonna be linked together, which is really, really quite handy. It just saves you work later on. You know, if you do, if you are just sort of winging things right now and you're not quite sure where your design's headed, if you build in this sort of intelligence, you're free to just play around with things without your model completely exploding later on. But that's good, mate, that's good. Right, there's one last thing that we need to do before we are almost done with the model, and that's to remove a bit of material from the bottom half uh, of the leg, because it's gonna be pressed up against the brake disc in sort of, uh, yeah, it's gonna be like inserted into the brake disc and then used to, uh, these holes used to, to bolt it in place. So we're gonna go into an ex uh, another sketch, and then we're gonna go with the XZ plane, which sketches through the middle, so we're, sort of going through these two legs here, and then press F7, I'll do a little slice graphics again, nice little handy cross section through the middle, and hit this face of the cube up here against it, I'll look straight down so it's easy to see what we're doing. Right, so I'm gonna draw, a, I'm gonna sketch out a square, like a rectangular profile that I'm gonna use to remove some material, but again, I'm, I've got nothing to snap onto here because we're sketching through the middle of cylindrical and arced faces, so, what we can do is use the project geometry tool, which will let us project that edge and then that bottom edge there. And that takes edges from the background of the model for us to snap onto. They're sort of reference edges. And if you snap onto them, if these edges change in location, then any new sketch geometry you've snapped onto them will move with it. So we're gonna right click and okay on that. Go into the rectangle tool, two points, click there and then snap onto the right hand side edge right click and okay we've got this little rectangular bit of uh, sketch geometry here to play with and we can put a couple of dimensions on we're going to say that okay this edge here is going to be i don't know what 13 in size and then this edge can be i don't know five I'm, i have no idea at this point we can come back and change it if uh, later on if we find that they are too big or too small Click finish sketch, and that gives us a little, and you can see the importance of that cross section, because that we were sketching inside the leg there. So we wouldn't have been able to see anything of what we were doing unless we did that slice graphics. So that's disappeared off into the twisting nether. And then we can go up to the revolve on the, the toolbar at the top. So this revolve works in a similar way to extrude, but instead of creating 3D material sort of away from the sketch, it spins the profile around a center line and creates material or cuts material as it's spinning around a center line. And that's exactly what we want to do. We want to take this rectangle here, which is automatically selected because it's the only thing in the model that can actually be used. And the center line is going to be uh, the Z axis with revolve for, for one reason or another, I'm not entirely sure why you can't use the, the center line of a face for the for a revolve spin they limit you to using these axes so we can select the z axis for the center line of the revolve and then you can see how the preview is green now when the preview is green that means it's going to create material and if we were to click okay right now we'll get the kind of satin ring thing going around the edge of the pot which we don't want we want to actually remove and cut material and then you can see by the preview what it's going to do it's spinning that rectangle around and everywhere it touches it's going to remove material click okay and that's exactly what it's done look at that that's looking pretty awesome that's looking pretty awesome okay last couple of things we need to do we haven't thought about what this is made out of don't forget this is a this is a kind of a in a way a digital prototype of something that you're going to make later on so we need to know how heavy it is. How and you only really know how heavy something is is when you when you tell it what it's made of. But how do you tell it what it's made of? Well, Inventor's got a library of materials of standard materials that you can use. You can create your own. I've done videos on that, but you can use Inventor's materials, which are pretty generic. Click this little drop down up here, and it gives you a list of just 
just general materials that are quite commonly used across the world aluminium steels copper iron that kind of thing some wood in there uh, we can go to stainless steel give that a click it'll each material's also got like a default texture assigned to it as well so stainless steel so all that shiny metal color and that's it <laughs> that's it but how how do you find out how much it weighs so obviously it's not falling out of the sky so how, how do you know uh, whether it's heavier or if it's light well it, every model ever has what's called a set of eye properties behind it and th this is like a, a set of metadata which identifies a set of key properties for every model and you find them by going to the file menu up here and then eye properties or you can right click the node at the top of the browser and go to eye properties or <laughs> you can right click the tab and then there's eye properties so there's numerous different ways to get to exactly the same thing uh, but if you select eye properties it brings up this dialog box there's a number of tabs but the one we're interested in is physical see the material was set to stainless steel that's there and then when you click update there's the mass, 0 0.8 kilograms. That's the total surface area of the model and its internal volume uh, is down there. Other properties that might be of interest to you, especially if you're making stuff within a business, is things like uh, part number. If you've got your own company internal part number, you can put that here, PT-12345. Uh, internal stock numbers, you can have a description. This can be the you know, rear axle carrier. These are really important downstream when it comes to things like parts lists. If this model ends up going into an ERP system, you might use SAP, uh, Microsoft Dynamics, IFS, whatever ERP system you use. When this model enters that, it needs to carry along these properties so it can be identified by people who don't have the CAD system. And then, uh, yeah, there's various other ones, but those are the, the, the ones of most interest to most people. Click apply on that, click close. And I believe, me, I believe that's as good as done. So let's save it. And we're going to save it into the parts folder and we can call this my carrier uh, you'd give it something i mean for most people would call it you know i'd say most people it, it actually depends where you work but uh, in a lot of companies that i've worked at you call the file by the part number but i know not everyone does that but let's just call this my carrier click save that's now saved and it's safe so if inventor does crash out at any point your work is saved let's hop back over to the go-kart should still be open on the bottom tab give that a left click and we're now ready to put our part into the assembly. Don't forget the reference to Lego. It's like placing that Lego block into this set of other blocks and then joining the blocks together. So how do we place that part into here? Well, because we're in an assembly, the ribbon bar on the top has changed and it's giving us the assembly tools. Notice again, when you jump between the environments, there's, uh, there's the carrier. We've now got part tools. That's all the assembly tools. So the, the first button on the ribbon bar is the one that gets used the most, and that is place component. If you don't see place component, you can click the arrow underneath that, whatever button you've got there, and you should see place there. Give that a click, and it's saying, right, okay, I, I, okay, I see you want to place a part into this assembly, but what, what do you want to place? I have no idea. Well, that's where you've got to tell Inventor what you want to do. So go into the parts folder and then you can scroll down to my carrier, which we just saved. Click open and it just attaches it to the end of your cursor. And now it's saying, where do you want to put it? And kind of naturally your brain thinks to, to itself, well, I, I want to drop it on the axle. How, how do I do that? You, you can't. You can't just drop it straight onto the axle. You've just got to drop it in space first. And then we use uh, building tools later on to put it in the right place so it just clicks anywhere in space with the left mouse button and then right click and then okay and that's it placed in space so at the moment that's free to roam you can actually grab it with a left mouse button you can see it's moving around and it's just freely moving around in space and we, we need to change that we need to get it dropped onto this axle and then pressed up against this disc so to do that uh, we need to create what are called constraints and constraints are inventors way of joining two things together it's like building uh, relationships between parts so we need to create a constraint between this part and the axle uh, so what I'm going to do is select the model and if you press G on the keyboard, this is a quick tip, uh, you can actually rotate the model around in space. So like you can say, right, well, I know I, I need to get it kind of in that orientation. It's going to be it's roughly in that form, but on the axle. So you can sort of pre-rotate it to where 
how you, you, you eventually want it to end up. We can right click and OK on that. So to activate constraints on the assembly ribbon bar, you can see you've got constraint here. We, all, we also have a joint button as well. Joints are very similar to constraints, but they work in a slightly different way. Uh, it's it's quite helpful if you're doing downstream simulation work, but also constraints do the, the job just fine. So we can select constraint, and we're going to use a mate constraint. There's all kinds. Bear in mind, mate, bear in mind, you could be modeling literally anything in the world that can be manufactured. Any shape, any size, any form. Inventor needs to have a constraint that kind of caters for anything you could possibly do in the future. And it has no idea what it is you do. So these constraints, there's only five of them, but they all have different kind of switches inside them in different ways of access and different surfaces and different contours and different models. So we can't go through them all, but we're going to use the most common ones. And the, one of the most common ones is a center line constraint. So you select the, the mate constraint, and then it's asking for two selections. Selection one is going to be the center line of our carrier. So give that a click when you see the center, the green center line running through the middle of the model. Give that a left click. And now it's jumped onto selection two. And selection two is the center line of the axle. Give that a click. Boop, click. You should hear a little noise if you've got your, your sound on. And then that joins the two parts together and fixes them center line to center line. So if you click apply and then just cancel out on that, grab this with the left mouse button. You can see it's now free to rotate along that axle because it's constrained and fixed center line to center line. Right, let's zoom in on it and let's F4 and orbit around. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to constrain it against the disc. So essentially the bottom face where we did that cut is going to be pressed up against that brake disc. That's the next thing that we're going to do. So that's called a face-to-face -face mate constraint. So we're going to jump back into the constraint command. Sticking with mate, we're going to select, you have to, you, you, this is where you have to sort of combine your navigation tools and it takes a bit of practice, but again, it becomes quite organic once you get used to it, especially if you have a 3D mouse. Again, link in the description if you want to check out a 3D mouse. It helps massively with this sort of thing. But we need to orbit around so we can see that face and then click. You can see it's very difficult on this color scheme, but the, the green cursors change to this kind of, it's got like a flat representation, to sh like a crosshair on the face, angled uh, in perspective to the face. You want to give it a click when you see that. And then we're going to orbit back around. So we're, we're mating that face up against that face. Click and then apply and then cancel out on that. And now this is free to spin around because it's constrained to the axle center line. And then that bottom face is constrained to the brake disc. Now, the only way this can move is to spin around because there's no, there's no constraints we've placed that are stopping this from spinning around. So what we're going to do is jump back in. I did that quite quickly. Let's jump back to the go-kart. The next thing we need to do is we need to line the bolt holes up. So you can see that I didn't know how what the distance was between the center of the axle and that hole. So can you remember when we, we sketched out the leg, we just left that dimension free to roam. So we need to do that, but I don't know how I'm gonna do it. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna come into the carrier and we're gonna close this down because we're gonna, we're gonna kind of evolve into a different way of working here. Right now, and everything we, would, we did when we were modeling this, it was away from the assembly. We were modeling this up without even knowing the go-kart existed. We can't see it. We, we've got no perspective or context for where this is going to go because it's a completely separate away from the assembly environment. So we can actually do something about that. We can close down the part. Now we're back into the assembly. If you double click this part file whilst you're in the assembly, it takes you into what's called in-place editing and it allows you to make changes to the part whilst the assembly's in the background. You can see how it's ghosted out everything in the background. So if you zoom out, it's left the part file prominent. Everything else is ghosted. If you look at the browser on the left-hand side, all the assemblies sort of grayed out and our part file 
is prominent and we can actually make changes to the leg we can make changes to the pattern all from within the assembly but we're actually working in the part it's dead clever and you can see exactly the the impact of the changes that you're going to make and how it's actually going to affect your assembly so that's quite clever anyway we're not going to do anything we're, we're, we're pretty much finished with the part anyway the reason why we were jumping into the part file is because we need to see which one of the legs was the original because we need to constrain the center of the original leg the hole up to the hole on the brake disc so if we hover over extrusion 2 you can see this one here is the original leg let's finish click return that takes us out of the part and then back into the assembly so what we need to do is constrain the center line of that hole so we can click this arc face here and we want to line that up to the center hole uh, the center line of the hole on the brake disc click apply what you're going to notice the inventor says, I ain't going to do that, mate. It's not happening. <laughs> I can't constrain those two holes together. The scent lines can't meet because the leg's not long enough. I can't actually raise that hole into the scent line here because the, it's, it's too low down. It's just not going to work. So we can go, okay, fine, fair enough. Well, I, I need to give you permission to do that. And the permission is called adaptivity. We can tell Inventor that this part that we've designed is free to adapt if the circumstances ask for it. So we can double click back into the part, go to the extrusion, make that adaptive. <laughs> the, the adaptive option has flown off the bottom of the screen. You can't see that. That's unfortunate. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, that gives me a good opportunity to show you something else. Instead of, if you're finding it a little bit frustrating and a little bit backwards, having to always go into the browser to sort of act, to interact with the features, you don't actually have to do that. In the main graphics window, if you press shift on the keyboard and then right click, that'll change what your cursor picks from faces and edges, which currently that's what it is. If you click in your model, it's picking up faces, edges, points, that kind of thing. But if you shift and right click, change that to feature priority, now your cursor is detecting 3D features instead of faces and edges. So we can actually go to the leg, right click on it, and this right click menu is now in context of the feature rather than a flat face. So we can now make that leg adaptive straight from within the main graphical viewport. And then that's that's pretty much it. That's that's all the permission Inventor needs. Inventor now knows if something happens and this leg needs to change in size, it's been given the permission to adapt via adaptivity. We can click return on the top, come back into constraint, select the, the center line of that hole, select the center line hole there, click apply. And if you if you get this, if <laughs> I, I kind of did this on purpose because I think in the first video version that I did of this, a lot of people got stuck at this point because uh, there's some combination of of constraints that lead to it it's still not working. So if you do get this, if it says the assembly cannot be solved, what you want to do is just click cancel on that, right? And then we're going to zoom out, just shut down this dialog box here. And the reason why it's failing is because trying to match these center lines up is conflicting with the axle constraint that we did. So we want to go back into mate 105, which I, mean, I, I assume yours should be the same. If not, then it, the first axle to scent line constraint that you created. Right click on that and then select edit. And then you can see you've got three solutions for the axle constraint. We want to actually go for this one here, which is undirected. Give that one a click and then hit OK. Nothing should change. It should still be constrained in the same way as it was before. But now that will allow us to line up the, the two bolt holes together. So go back into constraint, click that arc face, Send line of the bolt hole, click apply, and then you can see there you go, that's worked. And it's increased the length of the leg to allow the scent line of the two holes to line up with one another. Click cancel on that, mate. Now, if you left click and drag the, uh, the carrier that we've just placed, you can see it's not moving, it's now fully constrained in place. And if you also orbit around, you should see that the two holes, center line of that hole and the scent line of the carrier hole are also lined up together mate there you go looking absolutely awesome so the next thing we need to do is bolt it in place we need to uh, put a washer in a bolt a nut on the back side how do we <laughs> nut on the back side oh god <laughs> it's late in the week 
So how do we do this? How do we do we have to place in bolts manually and then constrain them up? Yeah, you can, but Inventor's got a wonderfully unique bit of technology called the bolted connection generator, which is part of its engineering design accelerators. So what you do is when you're in the assembly, you want to select the design tab up here. And this is why we got the content center working at the start of the video. You want to go to bolted connection and then this loads up like a wizard. It's a whole engineering wizard for putting in bolts and making sure they're strong enough. You can test forces through them using the calculation. Look at, look at this. Look at all this. <laughs> you can, you can, it'll test whether or not the bolted connection you've made is strong enough based on how long the bolts are, the materials that you're using, the forces going through them. It is incredible. It's even got fatigue calculators in there as well. It is mentally good. Anyway, we're going to go back to the design tab. And then we're going to select the concentric placement. And then we're going to select the first top face on our carrier. Let's do, we're still doing orbit around here. So the, the bolt connection is going to start at this face. For the circular reference, you want to select the cylindrical face of our hull. And then for the termination, we're going to just orbit around and it's going to be the back face of the brake disc. And that's all the inventor needs to know for where the bolt connection is going to go. It also knows that this is a six millimeter diameter hole because it picked that up from the circular reference. And then you want to select this line here, click to add a fastener. If your content center is not working, if you skipped ahead at the start of the video and you missed the part where I was telling you how to set up the content center, then this bit isn't going to work. You're going to get an empty box. So if you get an empty box, mate, you're going to have to jump back to the start of the video and then go through the bit where I was telling you how to set up the content center. It involves in you know going back to your files. Right, if this is the first time you've done it, did you see what just happened there? It sort of flashed up then vanished again. It's fine, just click the line again. It'll load up quicker this time, but sometimes the box can sort of flash up and then just disappear and it might take a couple of clicks for it to actually stay on there it's i mean yeah it's not it's, it's not the best that could be that could be a lot better but um a couple of clicks and it will get there eventually there we go mate right so what invent has done here is it's looked at the length between or the distance between the start and the end faces it's also looked at the diameter and it's referenced that against the library of parts it has and it's went based on those inputs mate if you want to bolt that long and at that diameter, all of these standards will suit you. And there's loads of them. <laughs> How do you, does anyone even know what a PN85 M8 to, I mean, I don't know. If you're not interested in those and you want just something from your region that you can buy, you can just change the standard over to ISO. And then Inventor will say, okay, well, based on ISO, these are all the bolts you can have. And if you're thinking, uh, do I want Phillips head? Do I want uh, socket head? Do I, what do I want? Well, you can change that here as well. You can come to the right-hand side category and you can say, well, just, just show me socket head bolts, right? There's a good chance because of what it is, it's going on a go-kart, it's going to probably be a socket head bolt. You can pick the ISO 4762. Of course it is, <laughs> socket head bolt. But it knows exactly how long to make that bolt because we told it where to start and where to finish that bolt. And if you're F4 on this, that green preview is exactly where this bolt is going to terminate. So it's going to start here. That preview there is the representation of the cap head. And then this is just a little bit of length added extra so that it, you know, you, you never have a bolt just finishing, obviously, to flush with the end face. It's got to stick out a little bit further. But you don't just have a bolt either, do you, mate? You need a washer. How do you put a washer in? Well, because this is an intelligent design accelerator. If you click the next line, Inventor knows you're not going to put a bolt under a bolt. <laughs> so it, it gives you washers and then it remembers the ISO category. So if there was any spring washers or any, anything that was an option at this point in the libraries, it would give you them. But it's just it's regular, regular flat washers here. So we're going to pick one of those. And it again, you see what it's done. It's raised the cap head bolt up and put the washer underneath it and then kept that bit of length at the bottom. Mental, it's mental. Okay, this one here, this this third clicked out of fastener will place a second washer underneath the first one, which I don't wanna do. I actually wanna place a washer at the bottom face. So you wanna select this bottom line, select another washer, and then the next line here, and it just gives you the nut straight away. Look at this, man, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So we can, there's all kinds of stuff in here, man. There's one, there's nuts with flanges on. There's just regular nuts. Just select anything you want. <laughs> Look at that. 
I, I've, I've known this has been here for like 15, however long years it's been in, and it's still amazing. <laughs> it really is. However, however, don't click OK just yet because uh, there's a little trick that I want to show you. And this is actually my mistake, but it gives me the opportunity to show you something else. Select the expand button down here. If you find that this is a common a semblance of nuts and bolts that you're going to use on a regular basis. You're going to create the same uh, ISO cap screw. You're going to use the same washers and the same nuts over and over again. You can actually add this as a template to uh, the bolt the connection wizard. So you can say this is going to be the go kart template, you know, cap head, whatever, something that you recognize. Click OK on that. And then what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to cancel out of this because what, what we should have done, we should have went in the bolt connection. Uh, and then we go to the concentric placement, select the top face as before. But for the circular reference, you actually shouldn't have picked the, the cylindrical face. You've got to pick the edge, mate. You've got to pick that edge there. And then we're going to orbit back around, pick that back face as the termination. And then you can see that it's enabled because we've picked that edge. It's enabled this option called follow pattern. So if we set the template that we've just made, give that a click and then select follow pattern, it detects that this hole, I don't know why it doesn't use the cylindrical face, it should know that part of the pattern as well, but never mind, is what it is. And you can see there, it's gonna give us a pattern of bolt connections following the pattern of legs, mate. That's amazing. Click OK, accept that, and then boom. Look at that, man, look at that. That is absolutely incredible. I've no idea whether why the, the nut's gone that color. No. Oh my God, <laughs> it's just full of innuendos. Uh, but yeah, there you go, mate. That's how you put in a part into an assembly and then bolt it in place. So we're just we're just kind of scratching the surface here. Obviously, it is just a test drive, but that's that's the basics of assembly modeling, mate. Placing in parts and then essentially fixing them together. But what you do next is you create a drone. Uh, it's usually the end output. Uh, you're legally contractually obliged to provide a drone in most cases. So we're going to create uh, a new file. And then towards the, the lower half of the template box, you've got these two options here, a DWG and an IDW. Essentially, they're the same, mate. It's the same template. It's the same border. But if you use this one, you'll get a, a DWG. It's an invented DWG, but it's openable by AutoCAD and most AutoCAD viewers. Or you can use an IDW, which is Inventor's Drawing Format. Historically, that's what Inventor's always had, but uh, it's not openable in the likes of AutoCAD, and you, you can only open it in Inventor. So most m newer companies to Inventor will use the DWG format. Older companies who've used Inventor for a long time are probably still on the IDW format. So we'll go with DWG, and that gives us this drawn border, which nobody's using. Obviously, most companies have des designed in and embedded their own title blocks and borders. But we can change the sheet size, right? Click the node at the top, edit sheet, and we can change this over to an A1 or leave it as A3. It's up to you, but it'll automatically adjust the block and the border to suit the new sheet size because these lines, these borders are sort of fixed and parametrically linked to the edge of the sheet, which is quite clever. But to create views, it's dead simple. What you do is click base. That, that makes a base view and it uses the document that's currently open. You can see we've got the assembly open in the background, so it'll automatically place that as a view top down. You can change the orientation just using this cube here and you can see you can just change that quite easily. Uh, to change the scale of the view, you've got this option here, so you can just make that, you know, 1 to 10, which is going to be, yeah, I'm, no, the scale's quite off, off isn't it? Uh, 1 to 5, and then if you want to, you can just grab, you know, grab your cur put your cursor over the green dot, left click and drag, you can move the view around the sheet. If you're happy enough that that's where you want it to be, you can just click OK, or you can create additional further projected views just by left clicking and then OK, and then it'll create that base view and then project it out. So that's with hidden lines removed. You can see that anything behind prominent objects is obscured from view. If you double click the view, just double click the green outline, you can then change the style to hidden lines on. And then it'll, sometimes that can be a bit of information overload, but especially once it's printed, these lines will just obscure into a big black dot, big black mess. I guess it depends on the quality of your printer too. Uh, but yeah, that's how you create drawn views. To create views of individual parts, you can just go back into base view, click browse this button up here, and then go to the parts folder. Let's go to my carrier, and then just drop that down. It's defaulted again to a top-down view. Click OK, and there it is there, looking pretty 
pretty simple and pretty basic. To annotate it up inside of drawings, you can go to the annotate tab and then select the dimension button here. And this again is context sensitive. It'll create a dimension based on what it is you click. So if you select the inner diameter circle here, you see that will remember that was 40 millimeters and then okay on that. Uh, if you select two lines, it'll create an angular dimension. Okay on that. The, the reason this pops up is you can sort of add in notes and you know, uh, extra bits of text after the dimension, which is something quite commonly done. Remember I said that when you create the, the hole using the hole tool, it embeds metadata in. Well, that's now where you can recall and utilize that metadata, it's something like the hole and thread note. Select a hole and it'll pull away and it knows that that's an M6 hole. Any other information that was embedded into the tool will be listed on here. And it's a customizable hole note as well. If you double click it, you can see you've got a bunch of properties here. Uh, that you can, you know, the whole depth value, anything you want that's to do with a hole, you can add that into this note without you having to type it in and it's all linked back to the 3D model. Dead, dead clever, dead clever. Uh, you can do things like section views, detail views, if you want to emphasize something it's a bit bigger, you can do that. Just say, right, okay, I want to create a detail on this region here. I want to make it five to one so it's a little bit more prominent. You can do that. You can even say, well, that's instead of it being black and white you can make it shaded as well if you want to and then if you want to give a sort of a better perspective of what's going on you can project out uh, an isometric view again make that shaded uh, we like to do that just to give someone just a, a visual cue as to what it is they're looking at because sometimes it's quite difficult to gauge what it is when it's just orthographic uh, wireframe views of something so that's that is extraordinarily quick <laughs> Very, very quick. Uh, but yeah, the last thing you do would tend to be is just a parts list. So on the annotate tab, uh, you've got the parts list button over here where you can pick any one of the views to call a parts list from. Uh, select OK. And then, well, of course, that's 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 actually picked the, the single part, which hasn't got a parts list, does it? Uh, let's delete that table. Uh, we'll select the top left view, go to parts list, select OK. And then that's a bigger table that's been generated there. Not enough room on the sheet, so I'll just drop it off to the side. Right click, uh, that's done. Okay, escape, zoom in. Uh, you can see there's your parts list there. Very few people use the default parts list. You tend to edit the table and add in your own columns and arrange it to suit, but uh, it's I guess the information is there to do a basic job. And then you would tend to balloon it up. What you can do is say automatically balloon that view uh, put a window around everything to say, I want to balloon the whole lot, select the placement around. And then when you move your cursor out, look at that, <laughs> it's just balloon, boom. <laughs> Everything's just balloons straight away. Uh, yeah, so that's the benefit of the likes of Inventor over something like uh, using AutoCAD. AutoCAD has a place, but for any mechanical design, anything that's you know calling off a bomb for a physical product, you, you just can't beat that. I, I know that's messy. You, you tidy the balloons up in production, but you can see the intent is there. But there you go, mate. That's roughly an hour of getting your head around Inventor and going through parts design, assembly design, and drawing design. It's just not even scratching the surface. This is just looking at, gazing upon the surface with envious eyes. It's it's incredible. So hopefully you can see now why this is such a big deal and why this is, I mean, it's, it's not the future. It's, it's not, it's been around for a long time. So thank you very much, mate. Well done if you followed that along. Um, if you're using the trial copy of Inventor, you've got 30 days to, to play around with it. Check out my channel and almost everything that I've covered is covered in some way by its own video. I've got four, actually six years worth of videos now covering this stuff. So have a dig through the channel if there's anything you get stuck on check my channel out. Uh, once your 30 days has expired, the link that you click to get the trial, that's my affiliate link. So if you do end up making a purchase of Inventor, whether it be monthly or yearly through the Autodesk website, I'll get a little kickback from Autodesk as a, just a referral fee. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't add any money on you to the cost of the license, but it's just an affiliate link. So um, yeah, if you do decide to go ahead and pull the trigger on a license of Inventor, then yeah, I'll get something out of it in return. Good little deal, I think. Uh, if you're a student, you can get Inventor for free. You can go to the education site and you can download Inventor uh, and anything else from Autodesk, any of Autodesk software for free for as long as you're a student. And anyway, right, I'm going to wrap that up there, mate. That's all I've got. Thank you for sticking to it. That's the refresh for 2020 
of the, uh, the the test drive video. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope it was useful. If it was, do let me know, and I'll um, I'll probably be doing this all over again in four years' time. <laughs> right. Cheers. I'll see you in the next one.